Okay, here we go. All right, we're going to close. Let me get your full attention up here. So this, I, this shouldn't take all period. You should have a little time to work on some stuff. Uh, a couple things I want to do, though. So let's, let's first of all, let's kind of go back and revisit one of these problems where we're isolating X. Uh, and it's a kind of a hard one, right? We're isolating X, and there's going to be some, our solutions are going to end up being complex with imaginary parts, okay? So what are the steps to go through here? Well, what's my strategy? Oh. Yeah, how come, though? What, what's my overall strategy here? PEMDAS backwards. I can point to a single X, and therefore I can isolate it, right? Yeah. So this is one where we can just do, use inverse operations to isolate X. Here's my X. Right, so... <clears throat> okay, so to get the X by itself, first step was correctly identified as subtract 4, right? We subtract 4, and we get negative 5 times the quantity negative 2x minus 2 squared equals negative 162. What's next? Divide by negative 5. Very good. Oh, how come we're not getting... This isn't what I wanted. This is what I ordered. Let's see. Sorry, yeah, they kind of got that number 150. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to make this a little harder. Let's do. Let's do this. Let's make that a plus. Okay. Make that a plus, which is going to change this to a one fifty positive one fifty four, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then that cancels the negative fives, and over here we're going to get a negative negative 154 fifths. Good? Okay. So now I've, 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 got a, I've got a quantity squared, so the next step is square root. Okay, so negative 2x minus 2 equals But if I'm square rooting both sides, whatever, well, sure, but what, But even before we get there, what did everybody forget? If I square root both sides, plus or minus. Uh, plus or minus the square root of all that, right? Okay, so if we're square rooting both sides, we all we recognize that if there's a negative inside, all that's doing, if there's a negative number inside the radicals, is turning it's becoming an i outside, right? Okay. So we know we're gonna get an i, and then we just have to simplify that radical. So on the top, let's see if 154, let's make a factoring tree and see what we can do with that. So I can take at two times what is is 154? 77, is that right? Yeah. Okay. And then 77 is just 7 times 11, no couples, right? Yeah. So what's that tell us? Uh, it's the way it is. Good. Everything's stuck inside, right? Yeah. There's nothing I can do to simplify it. Okay? So then we end up with, over here we've got the square root of 154 divided by the square root of 5, but we can't have a radical on the bottom. So, so we got to multiply top and bottom by no square root of five. There we go. No, no, no. So and explain that. I don't want to just tell you the answer. I want you to see why that's the answer. Why do I not have to multiply the other side of the equation by the square root of five divided by the square root of five? You're just simplifying that side. Oh, I got tons of hands. Raise your hands. <laughs> yeah, you had an answer. You had an answer. What, what was yours? Because you're only simplifying one side. Okay, but what is it? I mean, okay, that's, I like, that's true. That, somebody want to add to that? Yes, sir. Because you're multiplying by one. Yeah, I'm multiplying by one. Exactly. Oh. Right? I'm multiplying by one, which isn't changing anything, which is what Jim was saying. I'm only simplifying 
this one quotient, this one fraction, by multiplying by one, right? So I'm not really multiplying both sides by anything that's going to change anything, right? So then what's that going to give me? Over here, I've got my negative 2x minus 2. Over here, I've got my plus or minus. What am I getting on the bottom? Square root of 5 times square root of 5 is 5, OK? On the top, I'm getting the square root of 5 times the square root of 154, which is the square root of that product. So that's going to give me 770. Okay, and then is that going to simplify? Well, it's, it's not going to, is it? Because I just multiplied 154 times 5, and I don't see any 5s down here, right? Wow. Everybody get that? So there's still no couples there, so I'm stuck with the square root of 770 over 5. Now, what are the last two steps in order? Add 2. Okay, add 2. All right, now I don't need to put a plus sign there, do I? But I'm going to put it... Uh, I'm going to put it in front of the plus or minus, right? So I've got a number plus or minus something. Do you have to do that? No. Is it a great idea? Yes, it is. Okay. And then finally, you said the last step is? Okay, divide by negative 2. All right, so dividing by negative 2, talk to me about that part. Okay. So if I'm dividing, let's do this last step separately. So I've got negative 2x divided by negative 2 equals 2 divided by negative 2, which is just going to be negative 1, right? Yeah. Plus or minus. And then I've got a fraction divided by negative 2. But do I divide by negative 2, this one? How come? Because it's already plus or minus, so why divide by a negative? I'm getting both signs anyway. That's just hard unnecessarily, right? So we'll divide by the absolute value here because I'm already including both. But instead of dividing a fraction by 2, what should we do? Multiply, Multiply by 1 half. Good. So we're going to end up with uh, the square root of 770 over 5 times 1 half, which is just going to give me 10 on the bottom. Agreed? So then my final answer is going to look like x equals negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 770 divided by 10. Okay, good? All right. Okay, so moving on for today then. The, the topic, the big topic for today, yeah, that was good to go through a hard problem like that. The big topic for today is the other, the last arithmetic operation we haven't talked about. We talked about adding, subtracting, and multiplying. What's left? Dividing. Right? We've got to know how to divide complex numbers. So before we do that, I want to introduce you to a concept here, right? We know that conjugates, remember what we said conjugates were before. Conjugates are two binomials that use the same numbers, but in one case they're added and in one case they're subtracted, right? So regular conjugates, so conjugates would be things like a plus b and a minus b, right? Where a and b could be numbers, could be variables, doesn't matter, right? But they're they're conjugates if they fit that pattern. What does the product of conjugates look like? If I take a plus b times a minus b, what's that equal to? A squared, minus b, a squared minus b squared. And we know that because we already learned that factoring pattern, right? If we go this direction, we call it factoring. If we go that direction, we call it multiplying or expanding. Either way, we know that's what we get. If I multiply conjugates together, I get a difference of squares, right? Okay, what about complex conjugates? Complex conjugates fit the same pattern, only this time it's a plus bi and a minus bi. So now they're complex numbers, but they fit that conjugate pattern where we're adding in one case and subtracting in the other, right? So let's see what happens when we multiply out complex conjugates. So let's, let's take this example here. 
if I distribute the 8, what do I get? When I distribute the 8 to both parts, 64 minus 8i. Okay, if I distribute the i, what do I get? Plus 8i minus i squared, but what is i squared equal to? Negative 1. Good. Remember, all that did was it just, when we get an i squared term, all it's doing is changing the sign of that term. So that's going to become, instead of minus 1i squared, it's becoming plus 1, isn't it? Right? So then we end up with 64 minus 8i plus 8i plus 1. But well, what happens to the i terms? They cancel out. Okay. And then I end up with 64 plus 1 is 65. Okay, but what's the only difference there? What's the only difference in that pattern? Uh, we ended up getting A was 8 and B was 1, correct? Because these are in the standard form for a complex number, A plus BI, right? So in the first case, the real part A was 8 and the imaginary part was 1. In the second part, the real part was 8 and the imaginary part was negative 1. But 64 squared minus 1 squared would have given us 63. We ended up adding the B squareds. You see that? So what's the pattern going to be? If I, just in general, if I multiply out A plus BI times A minus BI, what's my answer going to be? I mean, we, we can do the math. In fact, let, let's go ahead and do the math, just so we can see it all play out. If I multiply out complex conjugates, A plus BI times A minus BI, if I do the distribution again, right? Let's do this where we have A's and B's where we're not being specific. We're not pinning ourselves down to any specific values for A and B. This will work all the time, right? So I get A squared, right, minus ABI, right? Okay? If I distribute the BI, I'm going to get plus B times I times A, which is the same thing as A times B times I, ABI, right? And then finally, I get positive BI times negative BI is going to be negative B squared times I squared, right? But all the I squared does is just change that to a positive, right? So look what happens then. The I terms cancel, and I get back A squared plus B squared. Right? Instead of a squared minus b squared, like I get for regular real number conjugates, if I'm multiplying complex conjugates, I always get a squared plus b squared. Okay? Say it again. The i squared becomes a negative 1. So it's just going to change that from a negative to a positive. Right? And so we can add this to our notes then. This is always true. We know that the, co the product of complex conjugates is always a squared plus b squared. No i's, right? That's huge because that gives us a real number. If I multiply complex numbers together that are conjugates, the i's go away and I get a real result. Okay? All right, so we can take a shortcut then. These fit the bill of complex conjugates, don't they? Wouldn't you agree in this case that a is 5 and b is 4? And that's just A minus BI times A plus BI. So what's the answer? Good. 5 squared plus 4 squared, which you're going to say, 25 plus 16, so it's just 41, right? Okay. I thought we were squared for I. Yeah, and the I goes away when you multiply complex conjugates together. Okay, why do I bring that up? Here's why I bring that up. I bring that up because let's take an example like this guy, okay, where I'm dividing complex numbers. 
Okay, we've got a rule for complex numbers, just like we had with radicals, only this is a more important one. With radicals, we always said you have to rationalize the denominator. I mean, you can't have a stranded square root in the denominator, no tenths in the basement, right? And so we know how to fix that. We just multiply top and bottom by whatever the stranded radical is on the bottom to get rid of it, okay? But is that an essential thing to do? No, it's not. It doesn't change the value of the number. In calculus, we never bother you. You do it this year because it's, I mean, there's a, it's kind of like good housekeeping in math. It's convention that we use, but it, it doesn't, it's not like it's essential to do. To get the right answer in Moodle, if it tells you to do it, you better do it, right? It's something you got to know how to do. But with complex numbers, we really can't leave an I in the bottom. That really is not, I mean, that's not going to work because in order for us to work with complex numbers, I've got to be able to write my answer in the form a plus bi. It's got to be a complex number in standard form. We have to know what the real part is and what the imaginary part is. For example, so we can graph it into complex plane. That's important to be able to do, right? So we cannot leave it like that. So what's our strategy going to be, do you think? What are we going to do? How am I going to get the complex number off of the bottom? What could I do? I'll give you a hint. It's very similar to what you do with radicals when you've got to get rid of a radical at the bottom. You're going to multiply by one in what form? <laughs> so I'm going to multiply by what divided by what? And my goal is to get no eyes on the bottom. Liz, you got an idea? Say it again. So, so I, I see why you're saying that, because if I multiply by i over i, I'm going to get an i squared there, right? But the problem is, if I multiply by i, I have to distribute it to the 6. So I'm stuck with an i attached to the 6. Is there is there something we could multiply a complex? What's it going to be? No, I can't do that. I have to multiply top and the bottom by the same thing. So I'm multiplying by 1. Let's see, is there something I could multiply a complex number by to get rid of the i? Gosh, is there something I could do for you? <coughs> what could I do? What could I do? If I want to multiply a complex number by something to get rid of the I, what could I do? I just can't think of something I could do. Ah, what do you know? The complex conjugate. Let's try that. I'm not kidding. Right? That's, that's what it is. Okay, so... We're going to multiply by the complex conjugate of the denominator. Well, what's the complex conjugate of the denominator? 6 minus 2i. Oh, what do you know? It says it right there, doesn't it? There you go. <laughs> so how come we're doing this? Well, if we're going to multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate, you can tell me right now what's the number going to be on the bottom. What's it going to be? If I multiply 6 plus 2i times 6 minus 2i. No, 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 no. Just on the, I'm just, when I multiply fractions. So hold off for a second. Everybody hold, hold, hold your thoughts for a second here. When I multiply fractions, I'm multiplying straight across, right? So on the bottom, ignore the tops. If I multiply straight across, I'm multiplying complex conjugates. Isn't that just a plus bi times a minus bi, where a is 6 and b is 2? What do we get when we multiply complex conjugates? a squared plus b squared. So I'm getting 6 squared plus 2 squared on the bottom, right? So I'm getting 40. 36 plus 4, agreed? So on the bottom, I get 40. And on the top, if I distribute the 5i, what am I going to get? Well, I'm going to get 5i times 6 is 30i, correct? And then 5i times negative 2i is going to be negative 10i squared, which is positive 10. Agreed? So I'm, if I write those in the correct order, that just looks like a complex, con or a, a complex number in standard form, right? Yeah. And so then my final answer, that's not how I want to leave it. I want to put it into that form. And so I don't want to write this with a, with a common denominator. I want to split it into separate fractions. Okay. I feel like I'm not, I don't have everybody 
let's, so I really should never see like phones or earbuds or anything out in an honors level math class, right? So take a second and if those things are out or you have those available, please put those all away. So I just want to split this up then, right? I'm going to split this into separate fractions. So I'm going to get 10 over 40 is going to be the first fraction that has no eyes. That's the real part, isn't it? Plus 30 over 40 times i, right? And then if I simplify those, what is that? Well, that's just 1 fourth plus 3 fourths i. And we're done. Right? Now I've got a complex number in standard form. So we figured out what is this quotient of complex numbers. That's it. Right? Okay, let's try another one. How about this guy? What am I going to do here? Yeah, good. Right? If I've got a complex number in the denominator, I'm just going to multiply top and bottom. Multiply by 1, right? Top and bottom by the same thing, by the complex conjugate of the denominator. Okay, so let's, let's, once again, let's just go through that process because this time it's a little bit tougher because I've got a, a complex number on top that's got both a real part and, a, and an imaginary part, right? So we end up with 17 minus 21i divided by 3 minus 8i times... What over what again? No, three plus. Right, we're not multiplying by that number, we're multiplying by the conjugate of that complex number, the complex conjugate. Okay, the bottom is easy. What am I getting on the bottom? Nine plus 64 equals 73. So the bottom's, bottom's good. I got, a, I got a real number on the bottom. On the top, I've got to go through the whole process, don't I? I've got to multiply, distribute the 17 through, so I'm getting 17 times 3 is 51, plus 17 times 8i is going to be 136i. And then I'm going to multiply negative 21i times 3, and I'm going to get negative 63 I, and then what's the last term going to be? 21i times negative 21i. So I'm going to get, good, I'm going to get positive, I'm going to get 100, negative 168i squared. So it's positive 168. Good, so I'm going to get a plus 168. Now if I just combine like terms, look what I get. 51 plus positive 168 is, what's that going to be, 219? So I'm getting 219, and then plus 136i minus 63i is 73i. Right? And there's, I've got it, but now I just got to split it into separate fractions. So I'm getting 2... 19 70 thirds, and that's got it. 73 has got to be prime, doesn't it? Yeah. I think so. I think so. So we get that plus 73 over 73 is just 1, right? But isn't 219 over 73? Yeah, it is. Oh, it is. You're right. Oh, my goodness. It is. You're right. So it's not prime. Actually, it is, but 219 is not. Yeah, you're right. Good eye. So we get three, oops. We get three plus one I for our answer then, don't we? If I split that up. 219 over 73 is three, 73 over 73 is one I. Okay, we good? All right. What if you get one like this? This is really easy, but I want to make it even easier than Okay, so what is, I got to get rid of the i on the bottom. What is, what is the complex conjugate of 6i, first of all? It is, right? Now, do you guys get that? So if, if we're going to take z, I'm going to call z, 
z is a complex number 6i, then the complex conjugate of z would be what? Well, what's the recipe for a complex conjugate? It's always going to be a plus bi and a minus bi. What's the real part of that complex number? What's a? Zero, right? And the imaginary part is six. So a is zero and b is six. So the complex conjugate is technically zero minus 6i, which is just minus 6i, right? Yeah. Okay. Do I need to multiply top and bottom by negative 6i, though? I mean, that's what I'm supposed to do in the instructions. But if the denominator is a monomial, we don't have to be that fancy. All I've got to do is multiply the top and bottom by something that's going to make the bottom a real number. I would be easier, wouldn't it? I could just multiply the top and the bottom, in this case, by i. And then on the bottom, I'm getting 6i squared, which is negative 6, right? And on the top, I'm getting negative 8i plus 2. So if we flip that around, let's put the real part first. So I'm getting negative 2 6 plus 8 6i, right? If I split the fractions up and put the real part first, which just gives me negative one third plus four thirds i. We good? Yep. Okay. Okay. So here's a cool application of this. So I'm kind of excited to tell you about this. This is good stuff. This is good physics. So what is the impedance of a circuit? I mean, if we don't get through this today, we'll talk more about it later. Right? But this is a really cool problem. So when you're when you're wiring electronics. You have to know there's there's really if you if you wire what's called an analog circuit, which is anything that's not a digital circuit, there's only three kinds of components that you can build any circuit with. Like if you wanted to build a radio, if you wanted to build a radio that you just dial in a station, like a really old old fashioned radio. All you would really need to, to build that are just two simple components. You just need a resistor and an inductor. Actually, you, need, you don't need a resistor, you need an inductor and a capacitor. There's only three different kinds of, of, of elements you ever build analog circuits from. Resistors. What's a resistor? You guys talked about this at all in science. What's it do? It well, okay, it, it right, it resists the flow of current. So a resistor is like you use resistors all the time. Like in your toaster when you heat up a piece of bread or in your oven when you turn the oven on, those are just big time resistors. You're pushing current through that resistor. And how does the resistor resist the flow of current? It, it pushes it, the energy it, out. Say it again. It pushes the energy out. It pushes the energy out. And, and a way to think about it is there's there's friction between the electrons and the resistor as the electrons flow through there. Is it truly what's happening now? Really? There's a good way to think about it. There's like friction between the electrons as they flow through. And what happens when you push current through the coils in a toaster? It gets toasted. It gets toasted, right? It emits heat. So resistors always emit heat. You're going to lose energy, you know, through heat. Uh, an incandescent light bulb is a resistor. That's all it is, is a resistor. They get warm when you push energy through them. And when they emit the heat, a lot of the heat, the energy that's emitted, some of it's visible light, but a lot of it's heat, right? So anything, like almost anything that you're going to push current through is going to have some resistivity. It's going to be a little bit like a resistor. So that's one of the elements. Really simple one is resistor. Uh, the other one is a one. The other one of the three, the three total is a capacitor. So all a capacitor is is you're going to have you're going to have a big plate of metal, usually something that's conductive, and the wire goes into this plate. And then there's a gap in between where there's nothing there. There's no there's no pathway for the current to flow through. And on the other side of this real thin gap, there's another plate. And so when you run current through this, it's going to stack up charge on one side of the plate because it can't bridge that gap. It's not, it's not a conductor in between. But eventually, when you get enough charge separated on these two plates that are very close together, the, the field, the electric field, will get so intense that you'll start to pass some current through there. Okay? So that's what a capacitor does. Like, what's an example of one that you could think of? So you know when you has everyone ever used like a like a digital camera when you turn the flash on and you can hear it kind of hum to you know what I'm talking about oh, like yeah. really high pitched whine so that's all that is is that's charging up the capacitor 
you're charging a, a capacitor in the flash attachment. So when you take the picture, it's going to bridge that gap and it's going to let a whole bunch of that stored charge go through a little resistor that's going to emit a bunch of light. That's all it really is. So you're hearing that whining is just pushing current into this under these plates. So you get a bunch of current stored there and then you just let it go real quickly and it, and it gives you a real zap of energy. Okay. Uh, that seems like an inconvenient shape though, right? To have a, you want you got these big plates that are stuck, you know, they're, they're really pretty large plates. You got these things stuck together, very close together. How would you fit that in a little circuit? Do you know what you do? You sandwich them together and you put a little, there's a little substance called a dielectric that you put in between. It doesn't conduct electricity very well, so you can push them together, but they don't touch. And then you roll them up in a tube. So if you ever look at a capacitor in a circuit, what it looks like is just like a little cylinder. It's been all rolled up. But there's still, really what it is, is just two plates that have been pushed together and they just rolled up to make it smaller and more convenient. So that's another type of element. And then the third kind is what's called an inductor. An inductor would look like a coil of wire. So you got, you got, a, you got a current coming in and it's gonna go through a whole bunch of loops in this tube, essentially. And when you push the current through that tube, the physics is, is a little bit complicated, but it creates what's called a back EMF. So it's creating a, the magnetic field and the electric field interact, and it tends to push the current backwards. When you generate this magnetic field, it tends to resist the flow of, of current through that inductor, and it kind of tends to try to push the current backwards. It's just a kind of what physics the way physics works, which is when you're looking at electricity and magnetism. You take these three things and you put them together, and you can vary the number of loops in the inductor, you can vary the size of the capacitor or the material you're sandwiching between. You know, how much, how resistant is it? You know, how, much, how hard is it to push current through it? The resistor, you can vary the material or how, how long the resistor is, so what the resistance is. And by just tweaking these three things, you can create almost any analog circuit imaginable. Like I like I I like to build speakers. So I'm building uh, high-end speakers, and all the, the circuits I build when I'm building speakers, if I want to create like the the filter network, the crossovers, all it is is just mixing and matching those three circuit elements in the right recipe, so you're getting just the right frequencies to go to the tweeter and just the right frequencies to go to the woofer. I'll tell you more about it later. But we got some cool examples. For this. Thank you.